What about our pious, angelic, and amazing white women? We can't have them thinking that they're useful for anything other than birthing babies. Black women? Who? of independence. It's that old ass piece of paper that says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, yada yada yada, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, blah 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 blah, all that bullshit. I think by now we know the founding fathers quite literally meant white men who owned property had certain unalienable rights, like the right to vote. That's it. Everyone else could fuck right off because <laughs> they didn't matter. How about white men who don't own land voting? I mean, they're poor, so... Black men voting? They're property, who cares? What about our pious, angelic, and amazing white women? I love them, but uh, we can't have them thinking that they're useful for anything other than birthing babies. Am I right? <laughs> Am I right? Black women? After years and years of feeling like second-class citizens, white women were fed up. Married women couldn't own property, had no legal claim to money they earned, and of course they couldn't vote. They quite literally lost their autonomy the moment they said, I do. Some states, like New Jersey, were an exception for single women. Those who owned property could actually vote there, but that ended in 1807 because, all right there, little lady, you better stop using that brain. Can't have that. And black women had it even worse because, well, they were enslaved. By the 1820s, the women's rights movement was in full swing and by the 1840s had amassed a rather large following. In July of 1848, prominent activists Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott organized the Seneca Falls Convention with the aim of addressing women's rights, including the right to vote. They got the inspiration after attending the 1840 World Anti-Slavery Convention in London. Women in attendance were forbidden from being on the main floor and were forced to watch from the gallery. Stanton and Mott were like, ain't this about a bitch, we here to support! And we can't even be on the main floor? Damn! So when they got back, boom, they were planning their own shit. The Seneca Falls Convention was attended by mostly women, but there were some men included as well, like Frederick Douglass, who was a staunch supporter of women's rights. Prior to the convention, Stanton wrote the Declaration of Sentiments and Grievances, modeled after the Declaration of Independence. She read its preamble aloud to the room. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. The document also called for women to be viewed as full citizens and granted the same civil, economic, and political rights as men. Now, before I continue, you must know that many things can be true at the same time. White suffragists like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony can be abolitionists and voting rights icons, and they can also be racist. All of those things are true. Let me explain. The women's rights movement hit a snag at the start of the Civil War in 1861. The country splitting apart gave people pause and efforts were shifted to help on the war front. By the war's end in 1865 and its immediate aftermath, Reconstruction Amendments were at play. They were the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The 13th abolished slavery. Great! Many who fought for women's suffrage were abolitionists, as mentioned previously. It was a win for all. Here's where we fall off a cliff. The 14th Amendment provided equal protection under the law, but only specified citizens as male. Oh. Uh -oh. Then the 15th Amendment came around, which barred racial discrimination, but not sex discrimination in voting laws. White ladies were like, WTF? What about us? Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony weren't having it. They were so opposed to the passage of the 15th Amendment that they each spewed racist rhetoric in their arguments against it. Like Stanton referring to black men as uneducated and sambos. Lovely. And Susan B. Anthony saying, I will cut off this right arm of mine before I will ever work for or demand a ballot for the Negro and not the woman. Grr. She was pissed. Stanton and Anthony's opposition to the 15th Amendment caused a rift within the movement, and it eventually split off into two groups, those who supported the 15th Amendment and those who didn't. Both women failed to recognize the rampant white terrorism black people faced after receiving their freedom that made having the ballot of the utmost importance in ensuring survival. Abolition wasn't some magic elixir that fixed and righted everything. Yay! Slavery's over! We're the same now! Oh my god, you guys! <laughs> Are we, though? 
There's absolutely no denying that sexism was prevalent, even for men who were for women's suffrage. White women had every right to the vote, but the necessity for the vote was entirely different for black men. White women wanted to be seen as equals to their husbands, brothers, and sons. Black men wanted to, like, not die. And have we talked about black women yet? No, because no one gave a fuck. Sojourner Truth spoke at an 1867 Equal Rights Association convention and said, There is a great strike about colored men getting their rights, but not a word about colored women. Black women had to deal with the intersectionality of their race and gender when it came to the right to vote. They had to be careful as to not tread on the fight of black men with their support of white women, and vice versa. Their specific plight was viewed as a race thing by many white suffragists, and the movement did not want to be tainted by racial issues. Ooh, honey, bless your heart, but that's black mess. We don't, we don't, we don't do that over here. In my opinion, that's some disrespectful ass shit. Black women were so alienated that they later founded their own groups, such as the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs and the National Association of Colored Women. Prominent leaders within the black suffragist movement were Frances Harper, Ida B. Wells Barnett, and Mary Church Terrell, who fought tirelessly on behalf of black women. At the 1913 Women's Suffrage Procession in Washington, D.C., planners were worried that letting black suffragists march would piss off Southern delegations. Ida B. Wells Barnett of Chicago was even asked to march in the back rather than with the all-white Illinois delegation. Boo! Shame! She didn't, though. And the women of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority incorporated out of Howard University were there to march proudly as well. I would do the call because I'm so proud, but I'm not a Delta and I don't, I don't want any beef. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton died before they saw women get the right to vote. The 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920, nearly 100 years after the fight for women's suffrage began. Their foundational fight made that possible. This is a fact. It's why you see a lot of women leaving I Voted stickers on Susan B. Anthony's tombstone. That's so nice. But the passage of the 19th Amendment did nothing to help black women and other women of color, particularly in the South. Black women wouldn't be able to vote until 1965 with the passage of the Voting Rights Act. So when you hear black women and other women of color bring up their concerns and critiques of white feminism and white suffragists, this is why gestures bigly history. But I speak the names of Sojourner Truth, Ida B. Wells Barnett, Mary Church Terrell, Frances Harper, those women who laid the foundation, and those women who helped to bring the vote home, women like Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, and Diane Nash. I think it's high time they had their day in the sun. Class dismissed.